You know, the greatest command tells us that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're to love our neighbors as ourself. The reality is, is it's hard to love a God that we don't know. And on top of that, very often the God that comes to mind when people think of who he is is not our God at all. There's a God that we wish that our community knew. We know that if they knew him, they'd be drawn to him. And we've talked over the last several weeks about this God, that he's our father. That if we just knew that he wanted to be our father and that he is our father, we'd be drawn to him. Or that he guides us, that we have a God who, who consistently, constantly guides us and wants what's best for us. If we knew that God, that we would be drawn to that. Or even that he's big, that no matter how big our problems are, our failures are, our brokenness happens to be, he's bigger than that. And, and to know that that would draw people to this God we wish people knew. A.W. Tozer said that what comes in our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And this last lesson is an answer to that. Because the truth is, millions and millions of people, when they think of God, they think of this mean, hateful, angry God who's mad at us. Not long ago, uh, actually, well, I say not long ago, a couple years ago, uh, I was watching Saturday Night Live. I don't know if you watch Saturday Night Live. I, I love comedy, and sometimes they're actually funny. And uh, they have these segues on Saturday Night Live, uh, and this guy in this real soft voice talking, and he's saying Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. Has anybody ever seen that? There was one particular deep thought that uh, they showed one night, and I thought it was interesting, and I want to share that deep thought with you. If a kid asks where rain comes from, I think it's a cute thing to tell him is God is crying. And if he asks why God is crying, another cute thing to tell him is probably because of something you did. Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. Isn't it funny that that's how many people think of God? That it's a God who is, who his emotions are manipulated by our actions? And, and how could you love a God who is constantly angry with you? How can we love a God who is, who is so disappointed in us that he can't seem to forgive us. Your first teaching point this morning is if your vision of God is not one, uh, is not of one you can love completely, your theology is wrong and your God is false. If when you think of God and your vision of God is not of someone that you can love completely, not of someone that, that is satisfied with our sinful nature or, or is willing to concede our unholiness, but is he someone that we can love? And if this God is not someone that we can love completely, then we need to back away from our theology, our study of God, and realize that that theology is wrong and that the God that we've been worshiping and we've been trying to please all those years is not God at all. See, love is, is an amazing, powerful thing. In our, in our culture and in our society, love is something that is a motivator that is in, very difficult to explain. Within the church, love is the motivation for why God is who he is and why Jesus does what he does. Love has this way of fueling the revolution that we're a part of and, and giving confidence to the souls of people like you and me. I want to look at it another way this morning. I want to look at it a way that you may have never thought of. In Genesis 1-1, if you're one of those people that's tried to read the Bible from cover to cover, I bet you've made it at least this far. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
You've probably read that thousands of times. For some of you, if you're new to Scripture, maybe you've read it once or you've heard it before. The question in the creation story, though, is not how did God create the earth. We've talked about that before. There are two things that are a part of the creation story. It's who created all that we know. It was God. But the part we seldom really consider is why did he do it? It's not just who did it. It's definitely not about how he did it. But that first chapter of Genesis drips with why he did it. There are a lot of people that uh, are, are Christians that when they think of this creation story, they think of it this way, that, that God all of a sudden was just bored. And he decided that somehow, some way, he needed a project. And so what he would do is, is that he would speak this universe into existence. And, well, there's this little place called Earth. And, and i tell you what I'll do. It, it seems like a pretty good little project. So I, I, it needs water. Here's water. Oh, Light. We need light, so let's, let's make sure there's light there. And, well, they need dry land, and so I'm going to create dry land, and there's vegetation. I'm going to drop some creatures into the sea. Well, I need a bigger challenge. Well, let's make animals that live on land. And then he gets to the greatest challenge. Well, you know, I need a real challenge. And he makes mankind. And then it gets more challenging. He makes women, and you can take that however you want. That's not how God did it. God didn't just get bored and start creating this project and just upping the ante with every layer and every level that he created. You were always on his mind. Everything that was done in, in this, this story is about us. He created this world that's around us. He made sure we had light to live by and water to live by and land to live on. And we had animals around that would feed us and vegetation that would nourish us. And he had all that. Why? Because he planned on putting us here. And why did he do that? Because he loves us. That's who God is. B.F. Uh, B. Myers, who is a, a very famous theo theologian, said, the love of God is like the Amazon River flowing down to water a single daisy. He did all of that. Spoke a world into existence. Separated the night from day. Separated the land from sea because of you. Because he loves you that much. But instead of feeling love, we often see God as an angry parent. Once heard a story about a, a little boy who went home and, and he was in trouble with his mom. And so he decided he'd run away. He runs up to his room and he crawls under the bed and he's hiding from his mom. Well, when dad comes home, mom says, you're going to have to go up there and deal with your son. So the dad trudges up steps and he gets, realizes the boy's under the bed. So he gets down on the floor. He starts crawling under the bed with the little boy. And the little boy looks at him and says, she mad at you too? We see God as this angry parent who's looking for people having fun and wanting to snuff it out. And that's not who our God is at all. As a matter of fact, the image of an angry God causes us to run away from a God who wants nothing more than to have us near. One book that I read when I first started this Christian journey was a book by Max Licato. It was a book called God Came Near. I don't know that anything has ever touched my heart more than those short stories of Max Licato because within every one of those sto stories, there was this idea that Jesus came out of love. That, that Jesus came near because God wanted us to be near to him. And then when I read this book, I recognize that this is a story of a reckless pursuit of a father who had lost relationship with his children. How he recklessly pursues us and, and he wants us to have reconciliation with him because he's not mad at us. He, he wants this bridge to be built between his holiness and our sinfulness and there was a way that, that it happened. It happened through his son who was God coming near 
The question this morning is this. Do you really believe that God could love you? Do you really believe that God could love you and wants to forgive you? Is that the God you see when you think of God? That image that, that is the most important thing about you? Is that your God? A God who loves you where you are? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Not even ourselves. When I first started the ministry, I've been preaching a long time. And I know some of you are saying, yeah, just today, a long time. I've been preaching a long time, and in the first many, many years of my ministry, I preached a lot about God's grace. I, I, I believe that this book, the ink stains in this book drip with God's grace. And, and I kept telling myself that I preached on God's grace so much because our little corner of God's house somehow didn't get the message about grace. Somehow we see God as this angry God who's dissatisfied with us and, 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 and wants to take us to task. The reality is that's not at all why I did it. I didn't find that out until about three years ago. A dear friend sat down and talked to me, and I told him, I'm, I spouted off that line, oh, I speak so much about grace because our corner of God's house somehow just doesn't seem to understand grace. And he said, Joey, that's not it at all. You talk about grace so much because you think if you talk about it enough, you'll believe it yourself. Is that you? Is that the God you see, one that's mad at you? One that could never love you and could never forgive you? If that's him, I want to share some words with you from the prophet Micah. Who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? That's his own people. That's us. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us, and he will tread, on our, uh, tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, listen to this part. You will cast all their sins into the depths of of the sea. How many of you years ago did something that you knew was displeased God and you asked for forgiveness and still this to this day you think I don't feel forgiven. How many of us walk around with this feeling of guilt and shame on our back? I have people come to me and they'll say, you know, back when I was 22 years old, I did this, and, and I asked God for forgiveness, but I don't feel forgiven. Will you, and you know what? I'll pray with you. But I just want to warn you before we pray about that, that God's not going to have any idea what we're talking about. He had thrown that into the depths of the sea. And, and if we're still feeling guilt over that, we've put ourselves in a prison of our own making, not a prison of God's. He wants you to know he's not mad at you and he loves you where you sit. It goes even further in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. Isaiah writes uh, about God, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins you know this is this is why I forgive people I, I consider myself a relatively forgiving person if someone does something to me I can forgive them relatively easily. if you do something to my family I, I struggle with it a little more but if, if someone does something to me I, I can deal with that that's how I deal with the target on my back of being a minister it's, I forgive people, but I don't forgive them for them. I forgive them for me. A lot of times I forgive people of things that they have no idea that they've hurt me. I'll, I'll forgive people for things that they have. And if they knew that they had hurt me, they wouldn't care. But see, I forgive them for me because I cannot emotionally, spiritually bear the burden of a grudge. I can't do it. And, and what God wants you to know about him is that he forgives us because it's good for him. 
I, I once heard this story about a guy. He was talking to his friend. He said, you know, my, my wife and I, we had a horrible argument last night. It got so bad, she got historical. And his friend said, historical? You mean hysterical? He said, no, she got historical. She brought up every bad thing I've ever done ever since we've been married. That's not who God is. God is a forgiving God who wants reconciliation for us. God's forgiveness is as much about what God needs as it is about what we need. I told you I've been preaching a long time, and yeah, I know, just today I've been preaching a long time. But I need to tell you why. Why I do what I do, why I love this job. And it's because I know in my heart of hearts that God wants nothing more than reconciliation with his children. And I know in my heart of hearts, there are many of you who want nothing more than to be reconciled to the one who created you. But that's not the real reason. The real reason is, is that I've seen what happens when that reconciliation comes together. I've seen what happens in the lives of people when they realize that God's not mad at them and that he wants this relationship with them with a father and a child. I've seen the power and the comfort and the strength that takes place in that relationship. It's this whole forgiveness thing. How does this forgiveness thing happen? Well, the first thing is we have to confess. You know, we need to be people who confess our sins. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That cleansing us, the, the word that's used there in the original language, it, it gives this image of a shower. It's like we're constantly walking around under a shower that continues to clean us. If we'll confess our sins, he'll continue to pour his grace in our life, over our life. But you have to want forgiveness. It's kind of interesting. When I was a kid, my dad had a 66 Bonneville. And I don't know if you've ever seen the old Pontiac Bonnevilles. It was sharp. Maroon, had a convertible. It was awesome. One day, we look out the window, and it had rolled down our driveway, and it was in the ditch across the street. Had to call a tow truck, pull it out. My parents still think I'm the one that did it. I was a little boy, and I used to go sit in the car and pretend like I was driving. They said, you knocked it out of gear, and it went down the driveway. Well, my dad's been gone for a long time, 30-some-odd 30 years, and, and my mom is now suffering with dementia, and sometimes she remembers things, sometimes she doesn't. And, and not long ago, she said, I know it was you. And, and, you know, they, they, they thought I was guilty so long that I, I, there are times that I sit down and I think, you know, I need to make my peace with my mom before she finally drifts away from uh, knowing anything. And, and I, really, I need to go talk to her about that 66 Bonneville. And, and, and then I start thinking, wait, I didn't do it. <laughs> I think my brother did it, but that's, that's not the story. You got to want forgiveness. And, you know, people who live in this works-based religion, they never seem to feel like they've ever done anything wrong. They, they don't want this forgiveness. Well, I read a story about a guy out in Seattle. Police answer this call. A man has been impaled on a pole. Now, you can imagine the gruesome scene. And they asked the man on the pole, and this is written in the story, asked the man on the pole what happened, and his response to them was, I'm a ninja. And under that, she said, he was obviously overconfident in his own abilities. You know, we're that way too sometimes. We don't want to confess because we don't think we've really done anything all that wrong. But when we have confession, when we do recognize who we are, God's response to that's amazing. Jesus said these words in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. He said, and he told this parable to some people who trusted him in themselves that they were righteous. They had overestimated their own ability. They were ninjas, right? 
and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Oh, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was unwilling to even lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, there is nothing more humbling than recognizing how holy God is, how unholy we are, and all we got to do is tell him. Tell him something he already knows. And we tell him something he already knows because we need to say it. Confession is claiming our unholiness before a holy God. So we confess, we know that we've done things that are wrong. Well, how else does forgiveness work? Well, the next is that we receive. We, we, we receive this forgiveness. Well, verse of Scripture here is uh, John 1, 11 and 12. He came to his own, uh, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believe in his name. And we turn over to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and it says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. You've received forgiveness. But my question is this. We know what confession is. We know that we go to the Father and we tell all the horrible, rotten things that we've done, that we're unholy and we know he's holy. The question is, how do you know you're in Christ Jesus? I mean, how do you even know that? Let me ask you this. This is just for the guys. Guys, how many of you are married? Just raise your hand. Are you married? How do you know? Oh, you're squirming, aren't you? You know because you probably stood in front of a big goober like me and said, I do. There was a ceremony. There was something that took place. There was a, a jumping a broom or breaking a dish. or There was something that said, I'm married. Probably a piece of paper filed with the court clerk's office. Well, how many people in this room have graduated from high school. How many, how many of those? How do you know? How do you know you graduated? Well, when I was there, I had on the cap in the ground, that really stupid little frilly thing, tassel. That's what it's called, tassel. Some, some of us still have those tassels, don't we? How do you know? Well, how do you know you're in Christ? Where, where's the jumping the broom? To our relationship with God. Where, where's where's the, the thing that says we're His? You know, you can search, search throughout Scripture and, and you'll find a lot of stories about baptism, a lot of verbiage about baptism. I want to go through a few of them real quick. Mark 16, 16 says, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. And that's part of jumping the broom, okay? Uh, but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. And I love the argument that said, well, you know what? Uh, it doesn't say he who disbelieved and has not been baptized. Well, okay, if you don't believe, why are you going to be baptized? Right? I mean, let's, let's think about that one. And then we go to Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, repent, each one of you, uh, and, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, this story is, G, is that, that Peter had stood up and he had preached uh, about Jesus. And, and the people that had heard the sermon were saying amongst themselves because they were pricked, pierced to their hearts, they were saying, men and brethren, what should we do? And this is what he says. The thing that we've missed is these are the same people who before had screamed, crucify him, crucify him. 
The story of Jesus had pierced their hearts to the point that they would do anything, and, and he says, you need to be baptized. Before he ascends into heaven, the last commandment, the last order he gives to his, his followers, go therefore and make disciples of all the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And even at his own baptism in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus walks 60 miles to be baptized. And he stands before John, and John says, I don't need to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, permit it at this time. For in this way, it is forfeiting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He was baptized, and in verse 17, and behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, when God speaks, I bet what just happened was pretty important. You look at the times that God speaks from, from out of the heavens to mankind, what he's about to say is something that is pretty important. He has just witnessed something pretty important, and his son has fulfilled righteousness, showing people the emblem of the death, burial, and resurrection that he would soon undergo. And he was pleased. You know, baptism to the Jews was something that was a ceremony. You see, baptism wasn't strictly a Christian rite. It was actually something that the Jews did. It was a ceremonial cleansing to take someone who wasn't born Jewish and to indoctrine them into the Jewish faith. A lot of times it was done in the Pool of Siloam, right in front of the temple, and it's a great significance to the Pool of Siloam that I don't have time to cover right now. But they were dipped in the water. They were dunked underneath the water, and they were raised clean, and that's why the Jews hated John so much when he said, you need to repent and be baptized. Well, why should we be baptized? We're already Jews. But you're not Jew enough. You're not God's child enough. You need to understand that that washing, that cleansing, is something that's deeper. That, that's it's more than just washing dirt from the flesh. It's an answering of a good conscience toward God. Peter tells us that just like Noah was placed in the ark, and God shut the door. Someday God will shut the door to this world. And those who are in Christ through baptism are the ones who will be saved. You know, there was a song out not long ago that uh, the, the chorus had, had the idea, and this was not a Christian song. This was a song that was played on Top 40 radio. And, and, and the chorus had the idea of this, that I want to go down to the river and pray because I need to have my pain washed away. And I think, wow. There are people who are listening to this, they don't even know what they're hearing. They, they, just, they may be not even believing in the God that we all know, but somehow, someway they know that there's something that's wrong. And, and they think somehow, someway they've got to have that washed away. And the truth is, if we're honest... At some point, we all realize that we need to wash away our pain and start over. We need to start something that's different. At, at some point, if we're honest with ourselves, we realize who we really are. We realize our ungodliness and our unholiness and God's holiness, and we know that there's only one bridge, and we have to wash away that pain. We receive this gift through the ceremony of baptism. The symbolism of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that says, I believe he is who he says he is. He'll do what he said he'll do, and I'm placing all my eggs in that basket. But it's more than that. It's more than that. Because it doesn't just wash away the pain. We don't start over. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how do you know you're in Christ? Think about that one. He is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Look at that closely. If we're in Christ, we're a new creature. All that old stuff, that's, that's gone. We're, the new has come. I love watching these 
shows on TV, these restoration shows, and you know, they'll, they'll take an old house and they'll fix it up. It's either flip or flop or fixer upper or, or, or whatever. Uh, and, and you see them come in and they'll take something old and they'll, they'll spruce it up and they'll make it look really, really nice. And a lot of times when we think of that, what God does in our life, we think of it in that way, that, that God comes in and what he does is he cleans us up and he makes us a better version of ourselves. You know, the best piece of furniture in a junk store is still junk. The tallest midget is still short. And God doesn't make us a better version of our former self. He makes us new. He washes away this pain and he starts us new. Maybe several times during our Christian journey, he'll tear us down and he'll build us back better. But when we begin that and we receive him for who he is, he makes us new. Ain't that cool? I want to end this lesson on a with a story, story that may be familiar to some of you. There's a famous writer by the name of Ernest Hemingway. And he wrote a short story called The Capital of the World. And The Capital of the World is a story about, it. basically it's a, it's a spin on the story of the prodigal son. It's set in Madrid, Spain, and there's this, um, this young man by the name of Paco who has a falling out with his father, and he decides that he's going to leave. And he's living on the streets of Madrid. And his father searches for him, just like that that. that uh, search that God searches for us and just like the story of the prodigal son and he finally realizes that by himself he'll never be able to find this young man Paco and so what he does is he takes out an advertisement in the local paper El Liberal and the advertisement read this this way Paco meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday all is forgiven. Love, Papa. Well, the story goes on. The paper is published. And the father walks down through the lobby into the front courtyard of the Hotel Montana. And there are 800 Pacos <laughs> all waiting to be reunited with their father. Guys, that's who we are. We have a God who loves us so much as we are that he doesn't want to leave us that way. We have a God who sees us for who we are and loves us anyway. And you know, if you were the only person that were ever born, Jesus would have died for you too. That's who our God is. And this book, it's his advertisement. Meet me at the waters. All's forgiven. <coughs> Love, Dad. Wouldn't it be cool to see 800 Pacos? Wouldn't it be great to know? And when we think of God, we think of the God who loves us so much that he'd write us this beautiful letter that all is forgiven. You can receive that forgiveness by confessing your sins and receiving it in the waters of baptism, being raised to walk in a new life and to be a new person.